And I want to show one more thing the president had to say uh, today before we get to the discussion uh, about the relationship with China. And this is his ability now to pick up the phone, as he put it. So I, I think I, I know the man. I know his modus operandi. He's been uh, we have disagreements. He has a different view than I have on a lot of things, but he's been straight. I don't mean that it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's just been straight. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we, as I said, the thing that I, I find most assuring is he raised, and I fully agree, that either one of us have any concern, Mr. Ambassador, any concern about anything between our nations or happening in our region. We should pick up the phone and call one another, and we'll take the call. That's an important progress. Uh, Rick Singel, this is one of those uh, demonstrations of the uh, dynamic nature of these relationships, because uh, I'm not sure we could have predicted a couple of years ago that the number one agenda item in a summit like this would be fentanyl. <laughs> Well, I think that's probably because they couldn't get much agreement on bigger issues. I mean, I know it sounds a little boring, but the biggest deliverable, as we said at the State Department, the biggest achievement of the meeting was the meeting itself. For the last year, year and a half, China has been trending away from the U.S., criticizing the U.S., talking about how relationships with the U.S. is impossible, America is encircling them. The fact that Xi Jinping came here to have this meeting is a gigantic achievement in and of itself. It makes the world safer. You talk about the mill-to-mill, the, -mill, the military, to mi military agreement. That makes the world safer. That's a big deal. And it's great what they did about this, the precursor chemicals to fentanyl. But the biggest achievement was the meeting itself. Uh, ben, your assessment of uh, what develops today in the uh, United States-China relationship? Well, you know, the relationship's been in something of a freefall. Uh, the United States has been imposing increasing sanctions on China, preventing the inputs of certain technology to the Chinese economy, uh, obviously at odds on key geopolitical issues, a lot of tension over Taiwan. And it's pretty unusual for a year to go by with that, the U.S. and Chinese president meeting. I think what I take away from this, uh, Lawrence, is that you have a war in Ukraine. Uh, that is in a very difficult circumstance. It's at a bit of a stalemate right now, entering almost into a third year. You have a war in the Middle East uh, that risks further escalation. Uh, and I think the administration felt it was very important to indicate that this one really big relationship, the U.S. and China, probably the most important relationship in the world between two countries, that feels like it's headed towards a Cold War and, frankly, could be headed towards a more direct confrontation over something like Taiwan, that we're at least putting a floor underneath the tensions between our countries and trying to reestablish lines of dialogue to address issues we care about. The military-to-military -military context, what that is really about is preventing an escalation that could lead to war in the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea. Fentanyl is something Americans care a lot about, trying to get China to do a little bit more to help Americans deal with what is a real crisis uh, in our communities. There are a lot of other issues where we continue to have disagreements, including Russia, including Ukraine, including human rights. But I do think it sends a signal to the world uh, and to the American and Chinese people, at least we're trying to talk these things out. And I think when the presidents talk like this, it sends a message down into their systems Let's like resume dialogue and see what we can get done diplomatically, even as we know we're going to be disagreeing about a lot of things. There was a confession in court today in the RICO conspiracy case against Donald Trump and multiple co-defendants. In being transparent with the court and to make sure that... Uh, Nobody else gets blamed for what happened, uh, and so that I can go to sleep well tonight, uh, Judge. I, I did release those videos to one outlet, and in all candor to the court, I need the court to know that. Uh, that was criminal defense lawyer Jonathan Miller admitting that he leaked the videos of the prosecutor's interviews with the four Trump co-defendants who have already pleaded guilty. That leak on Monday night provoked today's hearing on an emergency request by the prosecutors for a protective order covering the pretrial discovery evidence in the case. Prosecutors 
and almost all of the defense attorneys agreed to accept the version of a protective order written by a lawyer defending David Schaefer, the former chair of the Georgia Republican Party. Attorney Tom Clyde, representing a group of news organizations, objected to any protective order at all on First Amendment grounds. But Judge Scott McAfee made it clear that he will issue a protective order tomorrow. Until we decide what's going to be relevant and admissible, uh, this case should be tried and not in the court of uh, public opinion as much as possible, but before a jury and with competent uh, and with evidence that has uh, been vetted and approved. The court has the power to control in the furtherance of justice, the conduct of its officers. And I combine that with the need to keep the jury pool as untainted as possible, the need to keep discovery free flowing in this process so that all parties can be prepared and to prevent pretrial surprise. We've already seen what may happen if a protective order order isn't put in place, which is onerous logistical burdens that we're going to have to discuss. And I think a protective order uh, mitigates, uh, if not protects against all those entirely. So again, I'll be looking very closely, uh, Mr. Clyde, at some of the other First Amendment aspects, aspects you raised, such as the uh, ceilings to courtroom filings and that sort of thing. But uh, I certainly will be modeling a protective order based on that proposed by Mr. Schaefer. And after that hearing today, District Attorney Fawny Willis filed a motion to revoke bail for defendant Harrison Floyd, because according to the prosecution's motion, defendant Floyd has been publicly communicating with co-defendants and witnesses in the case. The prosecution included, included 15 pages of Harrison Floyd's social media postings and interviews he has done with Trump supporting outlets. In order to be released on bail, all of the defendants agreed to, quote, not intimidate any person known to him to be a co-defendant or witness in this case, and to, quote, not communicate in any way, directly or indirectly, about the facts of this case with any person known to him or her to be a co-defendant, or, quote, any person known to him or her to be a witness in this case. The prosecution included 17 examples of defendant Floyd publicly communicating directly to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who is a witness in the case, and Ruby Freeman, a Georgia election worker who is a witness in the case, as well as several public com uh, communi communications with co-defendant Jenna Ellis, who has pleaded guilty, and co-defendant Sidney Powell, who has pleaded guilty. The prosecution's motion says, quote, because of and in response to the defendant's intimidating communications, witness Ruby Freeman has been the subject of renewed threats of violence from third parties. Joining us now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is the co-host of the MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump, and a MSNBC legal analyst. Also with us, Gwen Keyes, former district attorney of DeKalb County, Georgia. And Gwen, let me begin uh, with this attempt to revoke bail here on uh, defendant Floyd. I just want to read uh, number 10. This is item number 10 that the prosecution included in their list of things he has posted publicly. Uh, this post says, it's over. Uh, Georgia Secretary of State needs to call his lawyer. He's about to go through some things, exclamation point. Uh, so that is a that is interpreted by the prosecution as a direct threat to a witness in the case, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. And what I find so important about this is whatever action the judge takes on this motion is a window into what we might expect this judge to do in attempts to control other defendants like Donald Trump. Uh, and Donald Trump, I'm sure, is watching very, very closely uh, what happens to this defendant. I think you're absolutely right. And again, the prosecutor, D.A. Willis, in this case, is doing everything that she should to protect the integrity of the case as well as the safety of her victims. This is a motion that you may see in any prosecution where you have some type of threats or intimidation. Uh, and so I'm not surprised that she filed it. Uh, and we'll see what the judge will do. But I, I do think the judge's decision in this case will be a be bellwether for the other 14 defendants. Uh, 
uh, Andrew Weissman, this, uh, the, these, every single item that the <laughs> district attorney included in this large package of offenses, according to the terms of, of the, the bond, uh, is very clear. They are all very, very clear violations. Now it's just a question of what is the judge going to do about that? Uh, I, that's right. And it is important to know that the judge does have things that he can do short of remanding the defendant and sending him to jail. Uh, I do think, though, that the the bigger picture here, when I was reading this, as much as there is very clear evidence of direct or indirect communications and intimidating uh, statements, both of which are prohibited by the terms of bail under which Mr. Floyd was released, is that it largely pales in comparison to what defendant Donald Trump has done uh, in this case and in D.C. Remember, on Monday, there is going to be a court of appeals argument on, just on the gag order, the, what he can say. Uh, but it, it, to me, the striking uh, note here was that it was brought with respect to Mr. Floyd, but it's hard to see how you bring it against Mr. Floyd and not against Donald Trump, where the threat and the risk of violence is far greater based on the words that he's used. This week, our next guest, Nadia Tolokonokova, a founding member of the Russian protest art collective Pussy Riot, led a protest at Indiana's Supreme Court against that state's ban on abortion. In a social media post, Nadia said the anti-abortion trend has reached Russia as well. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Koral, just wrote a letter to the state Duma with a request to legally ban abortions in private clinics. In 2012, we ended up in jail for two years for criticizing patriarch's politics. Joining us now, multimedia artist and activist Nadia Tolokonikova. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, tell us about your trip to Indiana. Why Indiana? Um, well, I was invited to um, do a lecture at Indiana University, and I happened to believe in uh, combining theory and practice, and I wanted to tell students about the um, protest art, about combining art and activism, but also I wanted to deliver them practice. And so at the night, uh, in the night, we had um, the lecture, and the next day in the morning, early on at 7 a.m., we had um, the performance itself. And um, I also, well... <laughs> we know that Indiana um, became one of the first states to install near um, total near total abortion ban, and it's just terrifying. The um, the situation in Russia with abortion that that you mentioned in, in your posting that, that they are now trying to move at least some trying to move in the direction of Indiana. It, well, th there is a trend. So Russian conservatives pick up the worst traits of the American conservatives. And uh, you have a very strange country, Lawrence. You have uh, clowns like Mike Johnson, who apparently needs permission to watch porn from his son. Um, they have the right to decide what I do with my body. And in Russia, um, the conservatives do the same. And Patrick Kirill also besides uh, proposing to ban abortions in private clinics, uh, he proposed that mm, people need to be, um, that it should be criminalized to induce um, a woman to make an abortion. And uh, it sounds like um, Patrick Kirill takes agency from me and other women like we cannot decide ourselves what do we do with our own bodies like we have to be induced by someone else 